Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm honored to have Nick Osborne, who's been a copywriter and direct response marketer for over 35 years. You look young, Nick. He has worked with dozens of major companies, including Citibank, Apple, New York Times, and many more. He's spoken at conferences and done in-house trainings for companies like Yahoo, Walt Disney Attractions, and several others. He was the winner of the AWAI Copyright of the Year, joining past winners that include Dan Kennedy, Ted Nicholas, Bob Bly, Richard Armstrong. Three of those four have been interviewed by me also. I was one of the, he, Nick was one of the very first to recognize and teach that writing for the web is fundamentally different from write, writing from print. And it seems obvious today, but back in the 90s, it wasn't so much. And his book, Net Words, was published by McGraw-Hill in 2002 and was the first books published on the subject of online writing and copywriting. Nick, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, you're welcome. Happy to be here. You know, Nick, since it is Inspired Insider, my question is about your lowest moment. Tell me about your lowest moment and how you push forward through the, that particular tough time. Um, well, there have been professional low moments where I somehow managed to allow myself to get into a bit of a slide. Probably the toughest was actually a, a personal moment. There was, this is going back over a decade now, but I mm. lost two very close family members within a few months of one of each other. Oh, wow. Um, and that knocks you off your feet. Oh, for sure. And of course, if, if, I, if I'd worked with a, um, an employer, I'd probably have got you know two weeks or a month off or something and stuff. But as a freelancer, you don't get that luxury. <coughs> so certainly there was uh, time, you know, a little bit of time I had to take off. It's tough uh, to focus yeah, that, when that stuff happens. It's probably really tough to focus well, yeah. on your work. Yeah, it is. It 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 does. It certainly I wasn't at my best. Um, but I, but I think what I fall back on. What I fell back on then was just actually the routine of work. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty structured in my work days. I'm not one of these on the beach in Starbucks copywriters. Um, you know, I sit down at work to start work at the same time each morning. I look at my to-do list. I look at my calendar and I work. I'm actually very structured. And, and the busier I am, the more tightly structured mm -hmm. my work day is. In fact... Um, some people where I've discussed this in depth uh, consider me obsessively structured hmm. and self-disciplined in how I work. Um, I actually, I, I segment my day. I'll, I'll give you an example. Yeah. If I have, let's say I have two large clients, two large projects running at the same time. Um, I will then devote the morning to one client, the afternoon to the other client. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll sit down at my desk. Uh, the first thing I do is I deal with some email, anything that I just, phone messages, whatever I need to get out of the way. Uh, then I, then I shut down all of that stuff, shut down social media, shut down email, and I, and then I'll have a time block, say from ten to twelve, where I'm going to be writing for this client. What I do is then I treat that block of time exactly the same as you would treat sitting an examination. In other words, you start at precisely ten. Hmm. You finish at precisely 12, mm -hmm. and you don't do anything else in between. If you're sitting in an exam at college, you don't. You don't go out and get a snack. You don't go for a walk. You don't answer the phone. You don't check your Facebook page. Right, yeah. It's an exam. I like that mentality, yeah. You, you, you sit down, and you do it, and, and you start at 10, and you finish at 12, and you give yourself a certain amount of work to achieve by that 12 o'clock deadline. And the same with an exam. You tend to, with most exams, you tend to finish pretty close to the end point because in your mind, you, you fit the time to what you got to do and right. it fits in. Right. Um, so, yeah, I'll, you know, and, and there have been times where I've had to segment into three slices during the day. But I treat, you know, and, and then after the 10 to 12, I give myself a break. I have lunch. I'll check my email again, whatever. I'll relax. I'll go for a walk. I'll, whatever. But then if I'm starting again at 1.30, I start. Uh, people know it from me. Like if I have a phone appointment, and it's if, if we if you and I had a phone appointment at ten o'clock in the morning, and I was calling you, and the phone rang, if you looked at your clock, it would be exactly ten o'clock, exactly, mm -hmm. not one minute past or five minutes past. So, mm -hmm. 
and, and I think when I went through that bad time and I've gone through other kind of dips professionally, what I do mm-hmm. is I fall back on, on structure. I just keep working, keep mm-hmm. working, keep working, keep working, uh, and then wait for things to lift. You made a note and said, I'm a farm boy. I am. What does that mean? Well, sometimes I think whatever question anyone would ever ask me, the answer is always the same, is that I was born on a farm. I was one of, one of four boys, which meant it was great for my dad because it meant he didn't have to hire people and pay them. Right. <laughs> Slave labor, um, child labor. But again, it, 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 there's, a, there's a work ethic. For sure. Being a farm boy yeah. is that. Uh, we had a dairy farm. So, you know, we'd bring the cows in from the field at five in the morning to the collecting yard, milking, they'd be back at four in the afternoon. Uh, doesn't matter whether it's raining, doesn't matter whether it's Christmas Day, doesn't matter whether you got the flu, doesn't, nothing matters. It's twice a day, every day. If it's my turn at five to bring them in in the morning, doesn't matter. You got to do it gotta, no matter what. You just, you know, you do the work. Yeah. Um, so, so I have a, that was how I was raised and, and like, Hey, I, I think I was 13 or 14 before I realized that other kids were given an allowance, uh, because, you know, I guess from the age of eight, I would line up on a Friday afternoon and pick up my little brown envelope of coins that would, you know, the money I'd get would be according to the amount of hours I'd put in. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as a kid, I was raised is that, you know, you you want money, you work. You don't, don't work, you don't, get, you don't get your brown envelope on the Friday afternoon. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's a strong work ethic, yeah. I think, that comes out of, uh, out of being raised on a traditional farm. Yeah. So what are, yeah. other lessons did you learn from your dad in being on the farm? Oh, well, all kinds of stuff. Respect for, respect for animals, respect for nature. Uh, you know, you look after the animals first and yourself second. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff I learned. Uh, hey, you learn all kinds of stuff on a farm. You learn mechanics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, learn, you, you, learn, you learn everything. It's, uh, you know, sometimes my daughter now will be, ama- you know, I'll get my hands dirty in the garden, you know, without gloves. And my daughter will look at me and say, oh, my God, that's so gross. And I'll say, you know what? Not really. You know, when I was your age, I was up to my shoulder in cow poo trying to unblock it. Unblock a drainage, you know, pipe or something in the collecting yard. So uh, yeah, there's there's some good real life lessons. Yeah. So what's the worst it's, thing you experienced on the farm? Oh, lots of worse things. Lots of worse things. <laughs> Getting up really really early in the morning. Uh, removing uh, probably about a ton of cow poo wow. from the collecting yard. You know, after milking on a on a wet icy November afternoon with the wind blowing and you're shoveling this stuff and, and you don't have a choice you don't you can't say oh look, I've done enough you just have to do it till the job's done hey there's tons of uncomfortable jobs like getting into the grain silo um, you know the, the big round silos where the grain is yeah. uh, uh, to clean up or there and you're half well actually lots of people die doing that but we didn't know that wow. at the time um, I mean there's tons of awful this, this is before any of that health and safety stuff people do these days. That does you know, sound when, pretty horrible. When I, when, I, when I think of the accidents we could have had on that farm, I was driving tractors down the roads when I was like 11 years old. No, not allowed to do that anymore. Yeah. So what yeah. about on the, the contrast that, Nick, uh, one of your proudest moments? Um. I think the proudest moments are probably where I said yes when it would have been much easier to say no. Um, what, what, one example is in the hang on a moment, you know, back in the late eighties. Um, I was just starting out as an online writer. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Actually, I was just writing articles about it and posts about it online. So this guy that was the editor of one of the online magazines that I'd written some articles for. He rings me up and says, hey, Nick, uh, and, you know, you're interested in speaking at a conference. And what had happened is that he was, he, he was meant to speak at the conference and he pulled out, but it was only like two weeks before the conference. So the conference organizer said, look, dude, we got a contract. If you pull out now, you've got to find a replacement speaker. 
So he rang me up and said, are you interested? And I said, well, tell me about it. And it was a big marketing conference in Seattle. About 700 people would be attending, uh, big companies, medium-sized companies, exactly the audience I wanted to get in front of. Uh, trouble is, I'd never done a PowerPoint presentation, and I'd never spoken in front of a group that size. And I didn't actually even have a business at that point, and I didn't actually have any clients, and I didn't have a website, and I didn't have a business card. I had nothing. Um, so I said yes. So I had two weeks to put together this one-hour presentation on writing for the web. Flew out to Seattle, uh, gave the talk. Uh, it wasn't my best talk by any means. It was my first talk, but it was good enough. Actually, I got three clients out of it. Um, but yeah, that, that, that one moment of saying yes, where it would have been really easy and comfortable to say no. Mm -hmm. um, actually, that was, that was the kind of liftoff ignition point for my business online. Yeah. Um, every, everything else sprang from that one event, <coughs> uh, that opportunity, and I was lucky. It was one of those things of luck where the guy pulled out and he called me mm -hmm. and said, hey, would you do it? I mean, it's part of it's luck, so, but part of it's not. I mean, he called you, right? So why did yeah. he call you? Well, I don't know. Maybe he was desperate. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he'd called five other people first. I have no idea. Um, but yeah, but no, it, it is. It's that interesting, you know, is, is how much of it is luck, how much isn't. It's, right. There's some it, luck. Wasn't luck, it wasn't luck because I grasped it and did it. Yeah. Uh, it was luck in that the opportunity just happened to come by at the perfect mm -hmm. time for me. So mm -hmm. it's always, hey, people say, you know, it's it's... I guess in a sense is like, oh, I'm not sure how to put it. There's, there's an element of luck in there, but it, it's mm. a, what, what you got to do is you got to, you got to turn those moments into an opportunity for yourself. Exactly. Um, and then that kind of turns things around. So, so I think often it's when it's, it, it's probably maybe, you know, pr proudest is when I could have said no very easily. And I said, yes. Yeah. 